Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast. I'm Zach Elwood. This is a podcast about better understanding people and why they behave the way they do. You can learn more about it at behavior-podcast.com. There's no guest on this episode. It'll just be me talking about the immense anger I see from some liberals on the Rittenhouse verdict and how I see that relating to the topic of us versus them political polarization. To give you an example of the kinds of emotional and extreme responses I'm seeing, I'll share a couple. Someone I know shared this take on social media. White America is sick to its core. I want to believe we can do better, but then a murderous white boy with an assault weapon is set free and celebrated again. And I can't imagine where we go from here, but further down, down, down. Kyle Rittenhouse is a cold-blooded murderer. And our justice system, justices in quotes, let him go free and congratulated him, end quote. This person also shared what I'm pretty sure is fake, distorted news that the judge had hugged Rittenhouse and called him a good boy. I think that actually originated from a Daily Show comedy bit. From what I can tell from a quick search, I don't think that actually happened. Colin Kaepernick tweeted the following, We just witnessed a system built on white supremacy validate the terroristic acts of a white supremacist. This only further validates the need to abolish our current system. White supremacy cannot be reformed. I'll talk more about Kaepernick's take later in the episode, but those two examples should give you an idea of the kinds of outrage I'm talking about and why I want to make this episode. If you've listened to this podcast, you know I focus a good amount on political polarization and the psychology behind it. I've interviewed a lot of researchers and experts on political polarization-related topics. If that interests you, check out my website for a compilation of all the politics-related episodes. If you're someone who hears about polarization and thinks, Why do people always talk about polarization? Clearly one side is horrible, so it makes sense that we're polarized. If you think something like that, there's an episode with a well-known polarization researcher who explains why polarization is a problem at all and how it's happened in many other countries and how the U.S. is not unique at all. I wanted to do this episode because I thought the high emotions around the Rittenhouse verdict might be useful for examining how us versus them polarization plays a role in what people are feeling, how they're reacting. This episode is focused on what I see as unreasonable liberal emotions and feelings about the verdict. This is not because I am giving conservatives a pass or think that there's nothing to talk about on that side. It's simply because my audience is primarily on the liberal side politically, and one of my main goals in talking about polarization is to help more people see how us versus them feelings affect their thinking and reactions. That unreasonable us versus them filtering of events is not just something the other side does, but something many people are doing even if you believe the other side is way worse. Our political anger is not nearly as much about the issues as we tend to think it is. It is much more about our emotions, about our us versus them framings. As Ann Applebaum put it in an Atlantic article of hers, America's left and right are radicalizing each other, end quote. The rest of us are kind of along for the ride, trying to make sense of things. Along the way, we filter out or give a pass to the bad ideas and behavior of people on our side while we view the bad ideas and bad behavior of people on the other side through the worst possible lens. We view the other side as a monolithic mass, mostly all as bad as the worst people in that group, while we view our side as full of individuals with a spectrum of diverse ideas and opinions, some right and some wrong. We increasingly view all hot-button topics as being very simple to understand, with right and wrong stances clearly defined. We ignore the truth that most topics are very complex, with a lot of factors and a lot of gray area. So I feel compelled to try to do my best to draw attention to these problems in the hopes that more people start to understand what the core problems are, in the hopes that more people will decide to work against simplistic divisive narratives and aim for more nuance, because that's how we will avoid worst case scenarios in this country, by more people aiming for nuance. To quote Kerry Callahan, who I interviewed on this podcast about trans issues and the polarization around that, she said, The complexity of the truth is inconvenient for both sides. To be clear, examining polarization as our core problem doesn't mean you have to think both sides are equally bad or equally at fault. I think this is a common misperception that people have that prevents them from being willing to think about polarization problems. Seeing polarization as the core problem is not a both sides argument. It certainly doesn't require you to stop fighting for what you believe in or criticizing bad behavior of people on the other side. Examining polarization as the core problem is simply about noticing how we are all humans reacting to things around us. We are all humans being affected by the us versus them narratives around us. It is about realizing how these us versus them dynamics get amplified and spread by many people from across the political spectrum. 
It's seeing things at an individual human level and not at a tribal group level. It's about recognizing the role that we ourselves may be playing in these dynamics and finding things we can do to help reduce our role in adding fuel to the fire and instead look for opportunities to bring people together. It's about recognizing that people on the so-called other side are responding to the bad divisive ideas of people on our side in the same way that we're responding to the bad divisive ideas of people on the other side. It's about recognizing that perhaps instead of traveling in the same path of least resistance, us versus them ruts we've been in, maybe we need to start criticizing and pushing back on the divisive people around us who promote us versus them narratives, whether they're on our side or not. And maybe we need to start rewarding and honoring the people who speak in more humane, persuasive, and bridge-building ways. Because anyone who's spent time looking into polarization in a serious way will tell you, we all have much more in common than we think, and our anger is often based on distorted illusions. So let's dive into the Rittenhouse topic. We'll be examining the outrage that many liberals have about this, and examine how some of that anger may be due not to the case itself, or to Rittenhouse himself, but to the perception that this is the current arena where our us versus them battles are being fought. This is not to say that there are no valid reasons to be upset or disappointed about the Rittenhouse verdict, but I do want to examine exactly why there is so much emotion and anger about it. I predict if you're someone who's outraged about the Rittenhouse verdict, you'll have an urge to turn off this episode fairly quickly. You may be so upset that you'll never listen to this podcast again, but if you do want this country to heal, if you do want us to avoid worst case scenarios, I'd ask that you please give it a listen to see if you find a few tidbits of useful perspective in it. I myself have damaged relationships with liberal friends and family by talking about these topics. I lose some Twitter followers and podcast listeners when I talk about these topics. I may even be hurting my ability to make money in the future. Time will tell. All of these outcomes are entirely common and expected results of attempts at bridge building and empathy in very polarized societies like ours. And that's why so few people do it. The costs are simply too high. I've suffered to work on these things not because I enjoy any of this drama or alienation, but because I think these topics are really the most important things we could be talking about right now. So I just ask that even if you do find some of my thoughts stupid or out of touch, please give the episode a listen. And hopefully you can cut me a little slack along the way because I wrote this in just a few hours and it's nearly impossible to talk about such tough controversial topics accurately and persuasively 100% of the time. I do wish I had more hours in the day to devote to this stuff. If you're listening to this and you're politically conservative, hopefully you're willing to examine similar divisive dynamics on the conservative side. Hopefully you won't just be sitting back and enjoying this episode as some fun liberal bashing, but you'll try to self-examine how similar things are true of your side. I hope you'll end up agreeing with me that pushing back against bad us versus them thinking within one's own political group is one of the most important things we could be doing right now. So let's start with asking, why are so many liberal people so angry about this case? Could it be the verdict itself? Do liberals believe that Rittenhouse should have been found guilty? Do they believe the verdict was unjust? Let's leave aside Rittenhouse's character or motivations. Let's leave aside gun laws you may think are bad and idiotic. Let's just focus for now on the verdict and if it made sense from a legal perspective. There are many pieces online you can find talking about how legal experts found the verdict unsurprising and expected. In short, Rittenhouse was able to have those guns when he did, and he had a strong self-defense case. To quote from a recent NPR article, I think that anyone who saw the evidence could see that the jury might have a difficult time coming to a unanimous decision that Kyle Rittenhouse wasn't defending himself, said Julius Kim, a defense attorney and former prosecutor based in the Milwaukee area, end quote. Another quote from that, some of the video footage, some of the still frame shots appeared to support the self-defense claim, said Chris Sakar, a criminal defense attorney based in La Crosse, Wisconsin, end quote. Another quote. The state has to prove that Kyle Rittenhouse provoked the attack by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And so the question is, if everyone in that courtroom is still not sure, if the judge wasn't sure, then how are 12 jurors going to be sure, said Kim, end quote. That's just from one article, and you can find many more. Based on what I've read about the case, I would have been surprised if Rittenhouse had been convicted. All this is a way of saying that it could be seen as correct that Rittenhouse was acquitted. Correct in the sense that it made sense legally. You may find it upsetting or believe that the laws should be different, but that's not how court cases work, the attempt to apply the existing laws to the existing situation. Or maybe you believe that the prosecutor should have tried the case differently and gone for lesser charges, so maybe you have some anger at the prosecution. But still, no matter what, Rittenhouse would have had a strong argument of self-defense. 
Another source of anger seems to be about our gun laws. I've seen people express anger that someone could go out to a high conflict area with a gun and kill people and face no legal repercussions. But if the law says what he did was legal, that is a statement about the law. That anger can be seen as directed at the law. But we all know our gun laws are very lax in America, very permissive. I can understand being angry about our gun laws. Our country's perverse relationship with guns has made me seriously consider moving overseas, not even taking into account our other problems. But obviously that is a frustration that is much broader than the Rittenhouse case. Anger at our gun laws doesn't explain why a lot of anger is aimed at Rittenhouse himself or the verdict itself. One reaction I've seen from outraged people is that this case sets a bad precedent, that it shouldn't have happened because it will cause more people to go out with guns. That may very well be, but that's unrelated to what the verdict should rightfully have been. Juries and judges don't make decisions based on the message they'll send to society. They make decisions based on what the existing laws are, and they try to reach justice for the person being tried. Another common reaction I've seen is that if he were black, he would have been convicted. This is pure speculation. Personally, I don't believe that's true. Let's imagine it was a young black man who did the exact same thing Rittenhouse did. Let's say it was a young black Trump supporter with all the other elements the same. I think it's probable he also would have been acquitted, simply because the legal lines were pretty clear, as they were in this case. But let's say the idea of racial injustice in the legal system is one thing that makes you angry. That is unrelated to this court case. That is something you could just as easily be mad about for any number of court cases that have happened in the past or going on right now. Put another way, it's not very logical to think that Rittenhouse should have been convicted because you believe a black person in his position would have been falsely convicted. Obviously, I can't get into all the legal details here. You may still have reasons you believe the verdict wasn't fair. But I'd say that, even if you think that, you should find the verdict unsurprising, for the simple reason that our legal system is built upon human fallibility. Our jury system is built on an idea that it's preferred that many guilty people should go free before a single innocent person is ever convicted. So in that sense, how can we be outraged when people we expect to be convicted are not? Human justice is always fallible. Jury systems are always fallible. Their verdicts are subject to randomness and initial conditions. Expecting court cases to go the way you want them to, I'd suggest, is immature. This is not to say you can't be mad about badness and injustice in our criminal system, but I'm simply saying that if you examine any court case, you'll probably find a lot to object to, because human justice is messy. All the people involved are imperfect and make mistakes. It's a messy business. And also, it's very hard to make comparisons between court cases. I see some people who will hold up two slightly similar court cases and point at the different results as if that comparison proves systemic racism or proves systemic injustice. But obviously, it's hard to find two cases that are exactly the same, and laws differ in different areas, and what prosecutors choose to prosecute differs, and how juries deliberate is subject to randomness and noise. In short, these things are massively complicated, and holding up two slightly similar court cases and saying, see, this shows how broken the system is, is simplistic and immature. Again, this is not to say that injustices don't exist. It's merely to say that you need more than weak comparisons or speculations about what you think might have happened. So let's leave aside the verdict and its correctness or incorrectness for now. A lot of the anger from liberals seems to be about how Rittenhouse is a horrible person, maybe even a monster. A lot of the anger seems to be around an idea that Rittenhouse represents everything bad they see about the right. The right's love for guns, their hatred for liberal protesters, their violence. I'd propose that such outrage is simplistic, that it doesn't match the complexity of the situation. That it's similar to Trump supporters who take a single incident involving the bad behavior of a far-left activist and use that as a representative symbol of everything that they're fighting against. Let's leave aside any objections you might have now, like clearly their side is worse because of X. We're examining how the us versus them feelings are similar at an individual level and how we tend to bring a lot of our team-based fury with us to these incidents and how that causes us to distort our perceptions. So let's try to imagine a political mirror image of the Rittenhouse situation. Let's imagine a situation where a racial justice protester was in a similar situation to Rittenhouse and ended up killing some people in Kenosha. Let's imagine it went down like this. A protester had gone out with a gun on the night of the Kenosha protests and riots because he wanted to, quote, protect his fellow protesters from fascists. If you weren't aware, there have been quite a few far left people open carrying guns at these events. I mention that just in case you think what I'm proposing is an unusual event. I'll quote from a Seattle Times article about a Portland protest in November of 2020. While others chanted, a young man stood quietly at the edge of the group of protesters gathered near a Riverside Park with a semi-automatic rifle strapped across his chest. 
The man said he had grown up with firearms and in recent weeks decided it was time to carry one to the Portland protests. In our hometown, we need to take care of our community, said the man who declined to give his name. The man is one of a small cadre of left-wing protesters who on Tuesday and Wednesday were openly carrying weapons as they pulled security duty on the perimeters of marches through Portland, end quote. In Seattle, during the time left-wing people had taken over an area around a police station, some people were open carrying there too. And you probably remember the militant Antifa person who shot and killed a Trump supporter in Portland, Oregon. So back to our imagined story. Let's say this imagined young protester was traveling around with a group of protesters, and this group had thrown a brick into a shop. Shortly after that, the young man became involved in a physical fight with a shop owner. The shop owner physically attacked the young man. The video showed that very clearly, and the young man ended up shooting and killing the shop owner and his friend. During the trial, a video was submitted for evidence that showed the young man, a couple weeks before the incident, telling his friend, Bro, I'd love an excuse to shoot some fascists. The young man's lawyers were successful in getting that video stricken as evidence from the trial, with the argument that people say all sorts of angry things they don't mean when they're venting or showing off and that nothing in the young man's past indicated that he was violent or intended violence on the night of the incident, that it was a case of just things going wrong and escalating, that it was all an unintended tragedy, and that, at the end of the day, the young man had been attacked first and defended himself. After this imaginary young man was acquitted, conservative news pundits made confident speculations about the case, like, if this had been a Trump supporter who'd done this, they would have wrongfully convicted him and ruined his life because the liberal-leaning court system is rigged against conservatives right now, as we've seen from other high-profile court cases recently. And liberals rightfully scoffed at such we're being victimized narratives that are based purely on speculations. Or let's say this analogy isn't direct enough, because it's of course hard to make exact analogies. Let's say it was a far-left activist with a gun who traveled to what was expected to be a wild, out-of-control conservative protest in Virginia because he wanted to protect, quote, vulnerable people from, quote, right-wing nuts. And let's say that ended with him getting attacked by conservative protesters and shooting some of them. If you're a liberal who's outraged about the Rittenhouse verdict, I'm curious, what would your feelings be about those other cases? If those people had been acquitted, would you be as angry about that situation as you are about Rittenhouse being acquitted? I would propose that you wouldn't be as upset about those other cases, and that's because you view Rittenhouse as the bad guy in this. I would propose that some of the outrage you feel about Rittenhouse is due to you harnessing the anger you have about Trump supporters in general and bringing that to bear on this case. That Rittenhouse is simply the latest representation of what you hate about the right, in a similar way that bad liberal behavior is often held up by people on the right and made to seem the representative thing that they're fighting against. But wait, you may be saying. Influential conservatives are holding up Rittenhouse as a hero. This is in no way equivalent because influential liberals don't hold up far-left people who kill people as heroes. And to that I'd say, if those kinds of points are reasons you're angry about this case, you're bringing in aspects that are not related to this case. In other words, if part of your anger about the Rittenhouse verdict is how he is being treated as a hero by the right, and about how bad and extreme conservatives as a whole are, you are bringing outside and unrelated anger to this case because none of those kinds of points pertain to whether Rittenhouse should be acquitted or not. It is a different topic. Maybe a good place to pivot to now would be to explain why I don't view Rittenhouse as a monster, why I see what happened as entirely to be expected given the highly polarized state of our country, the destabilizing impacts of violent riots, the ubiquity of guns, our gun culture, and other factors. To start with, it's entirely expected that bad things will happen at riots. Did you know that 19 people were killed during the George Floyd-related protests and riots in the United States? Wikipedia has a good summary of those if you want to check it out. It's under the heading of violence and controversies during the George Floyd protests. I'll read from a Guardian article about a few of these incidents. In Louisville, the photographer Tyler Girth was shot and killed at a downtown park where protesters gathered. The alleged shooter, Stephen Nelson Lopez, was homeless and had a history of severe mental illness and had reportedly been asked to leave the park earlier because of his behavior. Many of the protesters in the park were armed and on edge, and returned fire when Lopez started shooting, local news outlets reported. End quote. Here's another one from that same Guardian article. Las Vegas police officer Shay Michelonis was shot in the head during the protest, and reportedly remains paralyzed from the injury. End quote. From another part of that article, other law enforcement officers have been injured in non-fatal shootings this year, including two Los Angeles sheriff's deputies shot in Compton while sitting in their patrol car in mid-September, and two Louisville police officers shot in late September during a protest over the lack of serious charges against police officers in Breonna Taylor's killing, end quote. 
is the Rittenhouse incident any more or less horrible or tragic than the many violent things that have happened during those protests and riots? Is the Rittenhouse incident more horrible than any of the many violent interactions that happen at any time in this country or across the world? Because many violent interactions are capable of being seen through an us versus them filter. To mention a few examples, the Portland Antifa person who shot and killed the Trump supporter, or the George Zimmerman trial, or George Floyd's death, or some of those 19 deaths from the George Floyd related protests. There's simply no shortage of deadly encounters that could be viewed and used as polarizing lightning rods, as anger inducing representations of our national divides. And clearly, in many of those situations, people behave badly, stupidly, even hatefully. But we live in a nation of 330 million people, and we have a lot of us versus them anger. And we have a lot of poverty and a lot of mental stress and a lot of guns. And we've been existentially and financially destabilized by COVID. Are you surprised that we've got some bad things happening? Are you surprised that people are getting riled up in various ways? I'm certainly not. In fact, I'm surprised we haven't seen more violent encounters. Personally, I think that could be seen as due to the ubiquity of video surveillance and smartphones, something I'll be interviewing a criminology researcher about for the next episode. Let's talk about Rittenhouse's motivations, his righteous anger about the destructive riots that were happening at that time in Wisconsin. It's entirely unsurprising to me that some people would be upset about all the rioting we've had in this country and want to stand up to that. As a liberal-leaning resident of Portland, I've been disgusted and angry about the actions of militant Antifa people and the destruction and chaos they've caused in my city. And it's easy for me to imagine that anger through a more polarized lens. It's easy for me to imagine being even more angry than I am now. It's possible for me to imagine feeling that going out and protecting small businesses from chaos and destruction is a righteous and noble cause. The inherent dangers of militant protest behavior and how that can lead to so many bad outcomes and incidents is one reason I interviewed a militant Portland Antifa slash BLM protester last year for my podcast. I was curious about what kinds of philosophies such people were using as justification for their bad behavior. And I wanted to highlight to more people just how illogical and dangerous such ideas and behaviors were. Because that behavior largely seems to get a pass in liberal leaning media. It surely isn't as critically examined as conservative side violence is. During my interview with the militant Antifa person, they defended the idea of physically fighting with cops and setting fires to buildings. He said that he imagined a society without police, where citizens themselves police the streets with guns and enforce justice themselves. It was all pretty incomprehensible and idiotic to me. And as regards to their militant protesting actions, the lawless conditions that they create in the streets, however well-meaning and noble they think it is, very predictably leads to bad things, including bad things that nobody sees coming. Bad things like Rittenhouse situations. Violent actions result in violent reactions. People will get in fights, people will die. Street violence leads to more political polarization, with each side becoming increasingly riled up about the violence. Escalating street violence is a common pathway by which some countries have fallen apart. These people are playing with a dangerous fire they don't realize the power of, in a similar way that Rittenhouse was playing with fire and likely didn't realize how often his course of action would lead to unintended tragedy. It is possible to see Rittenhouse's motivations as noble, a motivation to protect against chaos and destruction. You may find such a view wrong and misguided, but all I'm saying is that it's possible to see it through that lens, just as it's possible to see the motivations of racial justice protesters and Antifa protesters who go out with guns as noble when looked at through a certain lens. It doesn't mean you have to agree with any of these people's beliefs. I certainly don't. It simply means being willing to try to see the things that are making them angry and not assigning the worst possible motivations to them. And that also means taking into account the very polarized dynamics of our country and the us versus them narratives that very influential people spread. One popular meme making the rounds on this topic is a quote from the Daily Show host, Trevor Noah. The quote goes, nobody drives into a city with guns because they love someone else's business that much. That's some bullshit. No one has ever thought, oh, it's my solemn duty to pick up a rifle and protect that TJ Maxx. They do it because they're hoping to shoot someone, end quote. I see that as a very simplistic way to frame things. A conservative could just as easily say the same thing about a liberal person who is carrying a gun and ends up shooting someone. There are always ways to view anyone who brings a gun to an event as wanting to kill someone, to view it through a lens of they want it to hurt people and not they want it to protect. Personally, I'm willing to give people the benefit of the doubt until I know more. We live in confusing and high emotion times. We have also been destabilized by COVID and the associated stresses of the lockdowns. To be clear here, my goal is not to defend Rittenhouse's decisions, no more than my goal is to defend leftist people who go out to such events with guns. All people who go out with guns should realize that things could end in tragedy, 
that the night could end up with them having killed people they didn't want to kill or end with them being killed. As Johnny Cash knew about, when you take your guns to town, bad shit can happen. And it's probably not a coincidence that this case involved a teenager. It's perhaps no coincidence that older people who felt the same anger and frustration as Rittenhouse didn't put themselves in the position Rittenhouse did because they were more mature and realized how easily things can go badly. But let's say you still think Rittenhouse is a very bad person and his badness is what angers you. I'd ask, are you equally as mad about every violent behavior where a political us versus them motive might be seen to play a role? Have you been as equally angry about cases where far left people did violent things? To take one example, are you aware of the case of William Van Spronson? He was a self-described Antifa person who in the summer of 2019 in Tacoma, Washington, attacked an ICE facility carrying a semi-automatic rifle and attempting to explode a commercial-sized propane tank. He died by being shot by police. To quote from a Washington Post piece about that, this could have resulted in the mass murder of staff and detainees housed at the facility had he been successful at setting the tank ablaze. Sean Fala, who heads U.S. Immigration and Custom Enforcement's Office of Professional Responsibility, said in a statement, end quote. I bet that if you're outraged about Rittenhouse's actions, there's a good chance you're not as outraged about Vance Bronson. You may even intellectually recognize that Vance Bronson's motivations and decisions were much worse and more reprehensible than Rittenhouse's, even if Vance Bronson didn't succeed in killing anyone. But maybe you're still emotionally more disgusted by Rittenhouse. Maybe you're searching for a reason for why your disgust at Rittenhouse makes sense. I'd humbly suggest the reason you're so much more viscerally disgusted by Rittenhouse despite Rittenhouse being a much more sympathetic person than many far-left extremists I could name, is because of political polarization. There's a very good chance you've never even heard about that Vance Bronson person and what he did. I myself hadn't heard of him at all until a few minutes ago when I was researching far-left extremism. I think that says a lot about what gets attention in the liberal-leaning mainstream media, and a lot about what drives the perceptions of many people on the left. Because I have no doubt if a far-right person had attacked an organization as Vance Bronson did, I would have known a good amount about him and that incident. Often liberal-leaning mainstream media will go out of their way to present excuses for far-left extremism. In an NPR article about Vance Bronson, a person named Mark Bray, who is a professor and author about the Antifa movement, argued that, quote, it's unfair to lump militants like Vance Bronson into the terrorism category without a discussion of the violent ideologies they were targeting. Anti-fascists, Bray said, aren't the ones going on hate-filled rampages, end quote. Here are some other examples of far-left extremist violence. There was James Hodgkinson, who in 2017 shot five GOP congressmen in D.C. because he was so angry politically. Then there are what the FBI calls black identity extremists. A 2018 report about extremism lists six attacks by black identity extremists since 2014, including Micah Johnson, the Dallas shooter who killed five police officers in July 2016, and Gavin Eugene Long, the Baton Rouge shooter who killed three officers 10 days later. My point is only that if Rittenhouse's actions disgust you and outrage you, I hope you are also disgusted by the kinds of far-left incidents I've named, hopefully much more outraged by those incidents because those few I've named are much more disturbing and vile. I'm mentioning all this not to try to compare far-left or far-right extremism body counts. Far-right terrorism is known to be more of a threat in terms of number of people killed. Personally, I don't think such numbers tell the whole story. It's possible to see left-associated protests and riots as part of this equation of chaos. I don't watch much TV at all, but one of the most disturbing things I've seen in this regard was John Oliver's episode about George Floyd protests, where John Oliver essentially promoted a burn-it-all-down perspective. When you look into police violence and the research about it, you'll find that it's a tremendously complex topic. There is simply no strong evidence that racism plays a big role in killings by police. That is much more about socioeconomic status, and the high crime areas that police end up policing more. As someone who has looked at police violence research a good deal, partly in preparation for interviews I've done on this podcast with a retired police captain, I personally think that our country's huge number of guns is the main culprit here, and how the lurking threat of guns escalates every encounter cops have. But the role of guns wasn't mentioned in John Oliver's episode. At least I don't remember them being highlighted. He didn't talk about the complexity and ambiguity of the causes behind police violence, as shown in the numerous academic studies done on the subject. He didn't talk about the fact that, yes, of course, the racist history of America has meant that many black people are poor and live in high crime areas that are policed more and have more interactions with police than white people do. But that doesn't equate to malicious racism. And it doesn't detract from the fact that high crime areas need to be policed more than low crime areas. 
John Oliver didn't talk about the fact that many people in high crime areas very much want a police presence and that defund the police type slogans and riots may be deeply unsettling to many poor people, including many minority people. Police presence is the cornerstone of every modern civilized society, but John Oliver focused on tying the concept of American police to the enforcement of slavery. This was an association that perplexed even one of my most liberal relatives who later asked me what the hell John Oliver was talking about. At the end of his episode, he played a clip of an emotional racial justice activist, Kimberly Jones, who said that she agreed with something Trevor Noah had said, that the social contract was broken. Jones said, and I'll transcribe this roughly, why the fuck do I give a shit about burning their football hall of fame, about burning a fucking target? You broke the contract when you killed us in the street and didn't give a fuck. For over 400 years, we played your game and built your wealth. Later, she said, as far as I'm concerned, we could burn this bitch to the ground and it still wouldn't be enough. And they're lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge, end quote. John Oliver, after presenting a very simplistic, unnuanced, and racially divisive view of what police violence was all about, ended his show on a note of essentially endorsing violence and destruction. I found all this disturbing and irresponsible. Where were the adults in the room? Where were the balanced, nuanced, objective views that sought to examine what I see as much more the truth, that we're mostly a bunch of people just trying our best to solve the problems we're dealing with right now? How much violence in the George Floyd-related protests might John Oliver's show have been responsible for? How much responsibility for that might be seen to lie with other influential people promoting similar views? Is it wrong to examine all these complex sides of the equation if our goal is to truly understand why people are doing the things they do? If our goal is to understand the violence around us? If a conservative host had promoted such a divisive narrative and endorsed violence in that way, would you find their behavior irresponsible? Do liberals get a pass from all criticism? and blame because they're on our side. My point again isn't to blame liberals or say that they're as bad as conservatives. I find the attempt at scorekeeping unproductive and impossible anyway. These dynamics are complex and overlapping. I'm a lot more interested in why individuals behave the way they do. What are the narratives driving their behavior? My point is that there are many divisive us versus them narratives floating around from across the political spectrum, capable of producing very bad behavior when people fully embrace them. Both the left and the right are capable of some apocalyptic, good versus evil rhetoric about the other side, or about the evil nature of society and government systems. And many people on both sides seem capable of excusing the bad behavior of people on their side, while being driven into a frenzy by the bad behavior of people on the other side. That is, after all, what tribalism and polarization is all about. When I hear about people who've been radicalized by these kinds of narratives and who do violent things, my primary emotion is sadness that people have let such divisive narratives drive them mad. It is understandable to me how people are seduced by all sorts of simplistic us versus them narratives. We become emotionally isolated. We become obsessed. We want to find a purpose for our lives. We want to be heroes. We want to be martyrs. We all have factors for why we believe what we believe. We are all human. I think what we need are more people combating the divisive ideologies around us. What we need are more people building more nuanced and empathetic narratives about how the world works and where we should be going. One of the more disturbing things about liberal reactions to Rittenhouse in the case has been the confident ways that people claim Rittenhouse is a white supremacist, or that the verdict represents a white supremacist system. The tweet from Colin Kaepernick represents a good summary of all of this kind of thinking. His tweet said, we just witnessed a system built on white supremacy validate the terroristic acts of a white supremacist. This only further validates the need to abolish our current system. White supremacy cannot be reformed. These kinds of takes are everywhere on social media and in the news. One Washington Post op-ed reads, Kyle Rittenhouse, whiteness and a divinely ordained license to kill. Congressperson Cory Bush was quoted as saying, The judge, the jury, the defendant, it's white supremacy in action. The system isn't built to hold white supremacists accountable. It's why black and brown folks are brutalized and put in cages while white supremacist murderers walk free. These takes are disturbing for the extremity of the claims and for the casualness with which people make them. One thing that probably helped promote the idea that Rittenhouse is a white supremacist was that President Biden communicated this to the public. Biden put out a tweet after one of the presidential debates about Trump, which read, There's no other way to put it. The President of the United States refused to disavow white supremacists on the debate stage last night, end quote. That tweet included a video that used a voiceover of a moderator's question from the debate. The moderator asked Trump about white supremacist violence. As the moderator's voice said, as we saw in Kenosha, the video showed an image of Rittenhouse. 
First, with regards to Rittenhouse himself, there is no evidence I've seen that Rittenhouse is a white supremacist. Rittenhouse's decision to go out to protect businesses and act as a law and order enforcer, while you may see it as misguided and stupid and reckless, or even as hateful or murderous, has nothing to do with white supremacy that I can see. It's maybe worth pointing out that many people at these events, including many people doing the destructive and violent things, were white. I don't know about Kenosha specifically, but in Portland and Seattle, most of the fighting with cops and damage to property was done by white people. All three of the people shot by Rittenhouse were white, as far as I know. The one slim piece of evidence pointed to by people that he is a white supremacist is that when Rittenhouse was out on bail not long after his arrest, he was hanging out at a bar with some far-right types, including people from the Proud Boys group. There's no evidence I've seen that Rittenhouse knew these people beforehand. Rittenhouse was wearing a shirt with the words free as fuck on it. At that bar, there was a picture taken of him putting up the OK symbol, which has gotten press for being used by white supremacists. There's a lot to unpack here, but first, while that symbol does seem to be used by some bad people, including white supremacists, it also seems to be something done by far-right people to trigger and upset liberals. I'll quote from the Anti-Defamation League website about how that symbol and its recent meaning originated. The OK hand gesture originated as one of these hoaxes in February 2017 when an anonymous 4chaner announced Operation OKKK, telling other members that we must flood Twitter and other social media websites, claiming that the OK hand sign is a symbol of white supremacy. The user even provided a helpful graphic showing how the letters WP for white power could be traced within an OK gesture. The originator and others also suggested useful hashtags to help spread the hoax. Leftists have dug so deep down into their lunacy, wrote the poster. We must force them to dig more until the rest of society ain't going anywhere near that shit. End quote. There is a definite culture of malicious trolling by many far-right people. And clearly some of the people who use these symbols are white supremacists. But even the group that gets a lot of press as being clearly white supremacists, the Proud Boys, have members who are racial minorities. To me, that group could be more accurately described as culturist than racist. And that's not to give them a pass at all, as in some sense, those two things can be very related and overlapped. But in short, all these things are not as simple as they appear. But let's assume for now that that OK symbol is a symbol of white supremacy. Or even let's assume it's one of significant us versus them hate. In an interview later, Rittenhouse claimed that he did not know what the symbol meant. He also says that he blamed that outing to the bar on his lawyers, John Pierce and Lynn Wood, who Rittenhouse's family later fired. To quote from a USA Today article, Kyle Rittenhouse claimed his ex-attorney, quote, set him up for a photo of him posing with purported members of the Proud Boys and making a hand gesture used by white supremacists. Rittenhouse blasted his former legal team, John Pierce and Lynn Wood, saying he didn't know the OK hand signal is now associated with white supremacy and claiming he didn't know what a militia was until after he was arrested, end quote. Some people have scoffed at this idea that Rittenhouse wouldn't know the meaning or common interpretation of that symbol, but many people simply don't know how few people are actually keyed into internet memes and meanings. The people who use a lot of social media and who stay abreast of the latest internet outrage tend to think that everyone else has the same obscure knowledge they do, or must have the same interpretations of things as they do. It would not be surprising to me at all that Rittenhouse wouldn't know what that symbol was, and it wouldn't be surprising to me that the people around him had pressured him in some way to put up that symbol. The reason that scenario is easy to imagine is because it's clear that the people around Rittenhouse at that time were people who did not have his best interest in mind. One of his lawyers at that time was Lynn Wood. Lynn Wood later gained prominence as being a prominent spreader of claims that the 2020 election was stolen. He's a pretty creepy dude who's into QAnon claims and such. Think about how destitute of judgment these people were to bring Rittenhouse to a hangout with far-right people, to have Rittenhouse out in public wearing an offensive free-as-fuck t-shirt, to have him posing for pictures with far-right people, all this before his trial. It seems clear to me that these were morally bankrupt people who had no concern that Rittenhouse, a teenager, might have his reputation destroyed in the public eye, right before a trial that might destroy his life. These were this young man's protectors. In that kind of atmosphere, and with the people surrounding Rittenhouse, and with the ambiguity of the OK symbol in the first place, and with Rittenhouse saying he blames his lawyer and disavows what happened that night, there's a lot of reasonable doubt here. If this is the only evidence you have that Rittenhouse is a white supremacist, it's pretty bad evidence. 
consider how easily conservatives might use equally slim evidence to paint a far left person charged with something similar as a white hating racist who wanted to kill white people. Personally, I think it's reprehensible to accuse Rittenhouse of white supremacy from the evidence I've seen presented. It's easy to forgive random citizens for making such claims, but it's harder to forgive people with large platforms, people who claim to be objective, who want to be seen as responsible thinkers and leaders. Let's consider Biden's tweet that basically communicated to the public that Rittenhouse was a white supremacist. Now, it's actually easy for me to give their team the benefit of the doubt because I've worked in TV news and digital media, and I know how easy it is to put out the wrong stuff. It's easy for me to imagine them kind of lazily and accidentally editing that video and just looking for things to match the moderator's voiceover and not really thinking things through. It's also easy for me to imagine, based on the press around the OK symbol, that the people making the video fully believe Rittenhouse was a white supremacist. I tend to think we're all being driven mad in general by things that can be easily explained by errors and not by maliciousness. We're filtering everything through a lens of the intended that instead of maybe that's just a mistake or a misunderstanding. But all possible motivations aside, surely you should be able to see what is so wrong and divisive about the President of the United States putting such a damaging and incendiary claim out there in the public before this person's trial. Surely you can see what it is that makes conservatives angry about that. In the same way that liberals are made very angry by confident, worst possible lens takes that conservatives make. In the same way that liberals were made very angry by Trump making tweets that seemed to attempt to influence court cases that were still in progress. And these confident pronouncements about so many things being related to white supremacy are everywhere these days. You can find influential journalists and pundits who confidently state that the January 6th Capitol riot was a white supremacist coup attempt or statements using similar words. But the fact is that there were black Trump supporters and other minority Trump supporters at that event. Simply put, believing the 2020 election was rigged does not require you to be a white supremacist any more than support for Trump requires that. It simply requires you to have believed that narrative about the election, which was promoted by many influential people, including the president himself and a lot of influential right-wing media. It's easy to see how people believe such things when so many powerful people are dedicated to spreading them. You may believe that Trump is a white supremacist or that he'd set up a white supremacist government, but clearly that is not everyone's view as shown by his significant support from minority demographics. I'm someone who believes Trump is a truly horrible pathological narcissist, and I also believe he may end up being the cause of or at least a core contributing factor in the downfall of our democracy. I have a very negative view of Trump, and it's still not clear to me how racist he is or what he'd do with more power. Even if I was pretty certain that he was a hardcore racist, I'm not sure what he'd do policy-wise about that, considering keeping his racial minority supporters and non-racist supporters from turning on him would probably be an important part of him retaining power. If you're someone who's 100% certain that Trump is a white supremacist, or you're certain of how him taking illegitimate power would result in a white supremacist government, I'd suggest that your certainty about something that many people are far from certain about, even people on your side, is an indicator that maybe you're looking at things in a very polarized, worse frame light. Returning to the Rittenhouse verdict and people claiming the results were white supremacist, considering that it's not surprising to many law-knowledgeable people what the verdict would be, to claim that the jury's finding was racist doesn't make much logical sense. Personally, I think if Rittenhouse had been black, he would have likely been acquitted just as Rittenhouse was. It seems like the legal lines around this specific incident were fairly clear, or at least we can say it's not certain he should have been convicted. Put another way, if a black person who'd done the same thing Rittenhouse had done had been found guilty, it seems clear that many law experts would have been surprised. And there are clearly cases of black people being acquitted of murder or manslaughter with a self-defense argument. There was a high-profile one about a black man named Coffey being acquitted a few days ago. But of course, comparisons of cases are hard to make because every court case is unique, and it's hard to compare court cases that happen in different areas and which have different judges and juries. So I'd say, considering all these facts and all this ambiguity, does it make much sense to call the results of this verdict white supremacist, or to claim that such a single case points to our system being white supremacist? So what's the problem with all these confident and common pronouncements that white supremacy is to blame for all the things we don't like around us? I'd argue that it has big negative effects, and that liberals really need to grapple more with what those effects are. Imagine that you're an average Trump supporter who does not see themselves as racist. 
let's make it a black Trump supporter just in case to drive the point home better. And imagine that you see liberal media and liberal citizens constantly painting everything with the white supremacy brush. Imagine how little respect you'd have for such incendiary accusations when you see little to no basis for those accusations. Imagine how these constant hysterical accusations might make you feel that the left has lost its mind, that their hysteria about those things must point to their unreasonable hysteria about other issues. All of this exaggerated emotion from the left makes it easy to not take them seriously. Worse, it results in some people reaching the conclusion, hey, it really does seem like the media and influential liberal leaders are exaggerating what's going on and exaggerating our divides. Maybe the system really is corrupt in some major way. Maybe we need to support people like Trump who are calling out these problems. Maybe once they start seeing some of the problems with bad liberal thinking, they may start to find other question the status quo beliefs more palatable, like that the election was rigged or global warming is a hoax. We need to face the fact that people are capable of recognizing the bad thinking on the left. They are capable of recognizing how deeply some of that bad thinking is entrenched in liberal leaning media and political leadership, and how little that bad thinking and behavior is critically examined or criticized by other liberals. That recognition of bad liberal thinking is how some people take what they call the red pill, how they start to question all the liberal ideas. It is a real rabbit hole that people go down. Trump saw a big increase in minority voters in 2020, and it seems quite likely that that support was largely a response to unreasonable rhetoric from the left. For example, the anti-police, anti-prison slogans. That kind of rhetoric is understandably scary to people who live in high crime areas, or if not scary, just downright weird and a bit maddening. And if you're by chance a conservative listening to this, hopefully you can see that all the things I've said apply to conservatives too. For example, Trump's reckless and divisive way of speaking have driven many conservatives away from the GOP. Pushing back against your side's divisive behavior and trying to bring more nuance to the discussion is how you make your side more persuasive and help it reach more people. In a nation where the political races are so close, one side being slightly more persuasive and getting just a few percentage points more can make a big difference. We should all be attempting to speak more to the people who aren't that extreme. The people who recognize, like we do, that the extreme narratives on both sides are what is driving our country crazy. Maybe that could be a narrative that could bring us all together more, if more of us had the bravery to call out bad thinking and bad behavior on our side when we see it. If you're politically liberal and you've listened so far, you may be thinking at this point, but clearly conservatives are the worst group, so why are you focusing so much on liberals? Any bad stuff on our side is dwarfed by what's going on over there. Again, I am not implying that liberals are at fault for our divides, or even equally at fault. I have much criticism for the right, especially for the leadership of the right and how they've embraced overt us versus them narratives in a way that Democrat leaders haven't. But for the reasons I've talked about in this episode and for other reasons we could talk about, the left has to be seen as contributing to these dynamics. The very definition of polarization implies that both sides must be driven a bit mad. It's impossible to imagine a scenario where there's only one side being deranged. But mainly, the reason I'm focusing on liberal stuff is because I have no influence over people on the right. All I can do is talk to people most likely to listen to me, who are mostly liberals. I think if you're striving to understand how our hatred and anger is continually on the rise, if you are really interested in understanding how these dynamics work and what the drivers are, you have to be willing to examine how people on your side are adding to those divides. As Anne Applebaum put it, America's left and right are radicalizing each other. You have to come to terms with the fact that none of this stuff is unique to America. We are going through the same polarizing dynamics that have befallen many other nations, like Venezuela, Hungary, Poland, and many others. We're not unique. We are just human. We are prone to the very human tendency to form into groups and go at each other's throats. And we may be aided in this tendency by our digital media and by how philosophically and emotionally isolated we are from each other in modern societies. We tend to think our anger is all about the issues, but it's not so much about that. It's much more about our growing perception that the other side represents all the bad things, all the bad thoughts. And you can examine these underlying psychological causes for our divides while still continuing to think the other side is worse. Even if it was my goal to get you to think both sides were equally at fault, which it's not, I would not be capable of convincing you of that. There is much to be angry at. I would not deny you your anger or passion, or pretend that there are not valid reasons to be angry. But I think the value of examining these ideas is that you'll be making your side more balanced, more persuasive. By working to reduce the polarized emotional takes of your side, you'll be making your side speak more to normal, middle-of-the-road Americans who, believe it or not, may be seeing things in a less polarized way, in less us-versus-them ways than you yourself are. 
Many people on both the left and the right are disheartened and disgusted by the constant framing of every hot button issue as the latest high stakes event that represents good versus evil. The more we strive for nuance, the more coherently we speak, the more we are able to speak persuasively to people who don't think the same as us. When I interviewed Jamie Settle, who researched the mechanisms behind how Facebook and other social media increase our us versus them animosity, one of the things she said was most useful in combating extreme polarization was demonstrating to others how we don't fit into the stereotypes of our group. The more people do that, the more people understand that we don't easily fit into such extreme and simple categories. The more it's hard to get mad at, quote, the other side and all their ideas as a symbol of all that's wrong with the world. And that idea is partly what motivates me to do this podcast, to demonstrate that complexity with my own ideas. If you think that written house is a monster, where is the compassion and the understanding of complexity that I think you likely bring to other situations, to other people? For example, I'd guess that when it comes to some violent and criminal behavior in the world, you're able to examine things like that person's environment, their upbringing, the world of ideas they live inside of, the influence of media, the ease of acquiring guns, our country's culture of normalizing guns, etc. Where is that curiousness about Rittenhouse's behavior? Where is that compassion and striving for understanding all the historical environmental factors that lead to almost all events? Where is that intellectual curiosity about why people act the way they do that I used to appreciate about many politically liberal people I know? Because it seems that those things are largely disappearing. Our understanding of and tolerance for others seems to be increasingly overshadowed by a desire to see everything through a team-based lens, to score whatever cheap political points we can in the moment. Mark Lilla wrote a book criticizing Democrat Party politics called The Once and Future Liberal After Identity Politics. I'll paraphrase something he said in there. Liberals tend to have so much empathy for people in developing countries, even those people who behave badly. They're able to see that there are many factors at work that affect people's behavior, that there are many cultural factors at work. But many liberals aren't willing to apply that same empathy and understanding for the people who are right down the street from them. I do think that we all need to get a lot more curious about the people around us and a lot more understanding about their motives if we're going to avoid worst case scenarios in the near future. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. You can learn more about this podcast at behavior-podcast.com. If you like this episode and think other people should hear it, please share it on social media. Personally, I think more understanding of our us versus them dynamics and how they work is one of the most important things we could be talking about. If you like this topic, please check out past episodes where I discuss political issues. You can find an accumulation of all the politics-related episodes on my site. I make no money on this podcast, and I spend a good amount of time on it. If you'd like to show some appreciation, you can leave me a rating on iTunes or on whatever platform you listen on, and you can share this podcast with other people. I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Zach Elwood. That's Z-A-C-H-E-L-W-O-O-D if you'd like to show me some financial support and encourage me to do more work like this. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies. Small Skies.